Hello. Alrighty, uh, we're gonna get started right now. So, welcome everybody. And then I'm super happy to be here. And then hopefully you guys do a really good lunchy. I actually uh, got some accident, <laughs> some pasta box. I actually mistakenly uh, throw it uh, because I got a wrong day today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about next 45 minutes around the Quarkus 3 and then like a virtual thread. It's a little bit technical deep dive, but pretty sure you are all smart, awesome, and a fantastic Java developers. So a uh, quick question uh, before we get started. How many people are actually uh, interested in uh, or heard about uh, virtual thread, like an open JDK project? Wow, it's a super... I need to. Okay, how many people actually have some uh, experience with the Quarkus? Fantastic. So my name is Daniel. I'm working for Red Hat as the uh, developer advocate, and then I specialize uh, cloud native runtime, such as Quarkus and then Spring Boot, and also a bunch of the Java technology, Jabo CAP, and then Infinite Span and Messaging Broker, and also JavaScript as well. I've spent a lot of time uh, bringing more Java application into cloud, like a public cloud, like uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, as well as uh, Kubernetes. I'm also a Java champion, and then uh, cloud founding uh, CNCF, like Cloud Native Computing Foundation ambassador for the past couple, like five or six years. I'm actually based on uh, Boston, United States. I'm literally attending JCon Cologne in Germany this week, but. I don't want to miss this opportunity, meet a lot of people in Luxembourg, my first time. So that's why I got to really wake up really early morning, like a 5 a.m. I took the train. My ticket actually is supposed to be just a one-stop transfer from uh, Koblenz from Cologne. And then I got to take the one train from Koblenz to Luxembourg. However, when I got the Koblenz station, uh, I cannot find my train anymore. And they said, yeah, there's no train, like a direct train from there to here. No more direct train. So how do I get there? And then they print out some chunk of papers and then you need to uh, take the bus like a uh, next 70 minutes. And then uh, you're gonna take the two train and the one transfer or something like that. So my, like uh, some journey was supposed to be uh, arrived here like a, uh, almost three hours. However, I actually spent more than four and a half hours. Fun fact is I'm gonna do the same thing right after my talk. I'm gonna back to the uh, Cologne because I leave my package stuff there. And then tomorrow morning, I'm gonna uh, take the another train from Frankfurt, uh, from Cologne to Frankfurt. And finally, I gotta uh, fly back to the Boston. So here's my contact information, uh, like a Twitter, and a uh, YouTube channel and a GitHub link and uh, my book. Yeah, feel free to chat to me by social media as well as uh, like, a, uh, like a YouTube, whatever you need, I'm more than happy to uh, keep connecting and have some conversation, all of you. All righty, so let's try to take a one step back, try to understand uh, Thread on JVM and the Java stack. So everybody using, uh, thread and the processes on your Java application. Well, here's a little bit, uh, just to remind, just everybody knows that, but just to remind that uh, real quick. So when you uh, develop Java application, AKA program, that actually running on inside the process, and then that uh, your application code is literally runs on, it's a process thread, you can say like a platform thread or a, uh, operating system thread. There are slightly between, uh, differences across the platform thread and the framework thread or operating system thread and the workers, but I'm not gonna uh, uh, deep dive with the kind of stuff, but you are more than happy to ask me after the talk and I'm more than uh, give you some what kind of stuff is really different uh, between the platform thread and the process and then uh, workers. And then in a short, uh, long story short, you're gonna run your application or running on process thread, like a platform thread. It really, it, but that's not one process thread. It's really multiple thread in one process. It really spawn new uh, thread whenever you have a new request. And then if it eventually your operating system actually schedule 
uh, your thread, like a process, and then uh, based on like a CPU memory uh, utilization. So this will really happen underneath when you run Java application running like a Java command line or running on a middleware like a Tomcat or some of the app server. So this is how thread works. And then we, we're gonna really talk about today imperative, like it's a non-reactive application. It's a traditional application, just uh, implement like a request response like a, over the HTTP or HTTPS. And so when you uh, invoke some new request, for example, RESTful API, and then it literally operating system, okay, we're gonna create a new worker. It's like a platform thread or process thread. And then when you uh, run your uh, application running on uh, like a worker thread, and then your Microsoft application now standalone. It's a literally connect to some kind of backend services, which is like a database, or a messaging broker, or some networking stuff. In that case, you want some have some. We're gonna say I/O operation just happen. You know, I/O operation happens, so your thread is just bra. Just which means you're gonna wait for uh, until the I/O operations complete. And then once your I/O operation completes, you're gonna go back to your thread and then you're gonna resume your job, the remain job. So that's really how thread works. And then you got another request in the meantime because of the first thread assigned to and, uh, one request and the second request coming up with a different API or different user. And then operating system, okay, we're gonna create another like a worker thread like a physically. And then you got the same thing as long as you have I/O operations. So that's what we can say the blocking I/O. So that is a, uh, like a non-reactive application. The problem is you have a very limited uh, resources to create a worker thread because your resources like a CPU memory is not unlimited. So based on like a 64 gig or even 120 gig, it's already some limited number, which means that you can have limited resources to create a worker. It doesn't matter how many requests you can control and manage this and then schedule. So that's reactive problem actually was born and designed to um, manage this kind of concurrency. So as you can see, for example, one like a thread, uh, and then we're gonna some still IO operations stuff, but this is not blocking your thread itself. However, it's actually share your existing thread, you're gonna say like an event loop. So you don't see any blocking in the thread in the like a illustration. And then even if you can manage and schedule multiple requests at the same time, one thread, and then, but how do you resume and uh, back to the, your stop it thread? That's why you have uh, some executor, executor, and also continuation mechanism on your reactive programming model. So continuation is a uh, pretty simple. You just store your thread state, and then what is your callback? So just really, you have uh, many experience to develop your Java application, implement like a callback function, or the lambda expression. So literally continuation actually call, invoke the callback function or a lambda expression when you are your operation is done and back to that point to resume your rest of the job. But I'm not gonna say reactive programming model only use one single thread. You can actually use a multiple thread, but not gonna to create thread for each request. That is the big difference between imperative and reactive programming. And here is the bottom line when you develop reactive programming. I know I've been there a lot of time spent more than a uh, couple years to uh, migrate from Spring Boot to Spring Reactive. It's a totally different animal. So because the, it's a me method uh, signature, it's, uh, you're gonna use the Spring uh, Web Flux, which means to uh, return Mono and Flux. You can also integrate like a Spring integration ecosystem. Sometimes you need to uh, deploy that and Kafka cluster and integration, you have to need to implement Spring functions and a Spring uh, Cloud integrate uh, ecosystem as well. So it's uh, not just uh, changes some of the code of the line, your existing Spring Boot to Spring Reactive. It's uh, totally rewriting and refactoring your existing Spring Boot to Spring Reactive. Because uh, as you see, even if underneath technology, how to manage and scoping and scheduling your uh, literally uh, thread mechanism is totally different design and architecture. That's why you need to rewrite your application itself. 
That's totally makes sense. So one of the bottom line, whenever you design React and programming, you always need to never ever try to block the IO thread. If you block the IO thread mistakenly, and then your reactive event loop is just broken, come back to like a worker thread right away. So this is just some blue po like a blue point uh, between the uh, imperative, aka non-reactive and reactive programming. So non-reactive programming, you've been doing a lot for the past maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years. It's uh, too obvious. You can just return your like a string or a collection like array list or a list type, pretty obvious. And then you just call database and then just get. Uh, the already collection and the return to your web UI and the rendering like a tables or shiny HTML. So it's a pretty much easier to uh, implement your business services based on non-reactive application. That's why we're gonna say simple development model. However, it's, it's, it's resource is so expensive. Like I said, let's say we have a need to one uh, megabyte for one worker thread, but we have a 10 microservices, which means we need to 10 megabyte for like a 10 worker thread, just like a this thread stuff. However, reactive programming is a little bit not easy. I mean, it's a more like a complicated to run how to develop. Even if you are a, a like a beginner developer to develop reactive programming with Spring Reactive, you got a bunch of stuff to learn and then do practices. So that's why it's a, and then more important thing is it's not, obvious to devolve your application regardless of matter. So for example, when you implement your method, you're gonna to use like a lambda expression as well. You're gonna mapping your result from like a database into your Java beans, and then you're gonna filtering which one I need to actually dispatch. And the last thing is you're gonna subscribe the result as a streaming. So it's not like a simple, like a development programming model, so that's why it's really complicated. And then, however, good thing is really good, I mean, high concurrency, and the resources are really efficient. So for example, here, I have a 10 microservices and 10 worker thread. However, I just need to two, like a worker thread as an event loop to process all same microservices or workload. So that's why reactive is pretty much more like a concurrency, even if it's a complicated. So if you think about your existing microservices on your production, okay, we have maybe just less than 10 microservices running on virtual machine. You don't need to think about reactive programming model. However, oh, we need to deploy this at Microsoft's application like a cloud, AKA Kubernetes. And then, wow, so it could be scaled out maybe 10,000 container pod in some point future and based on like a CPU memory utilization or event streaming like from Kafka or Prometheus or Apache Persa, and how to manage the scalability and how to, even it's not only scalability, you also rebalancing all workload and the concurrency level, not only platform, but also application layer as well. So that's reactive programming should be considered and redesign your existing microservices for that scalability. So what about the project loom? It's a project loom. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, under like a uh, under uh, new, like uh, some project uh, under the like a uh, open JDK. So the idea of the project loom try to combine uh, benefit from both sides. So as I mentioned earlier, the non-reactive programming is really easy. I can develop right away. Once I know what kind of business logic I need to develop, okay, I need to uh, dispatch this database data and then put into like a web UI. We do some kind of uh, HTML file response UI in the mobile and even web pages. I know how do I do that. So, but we're gonna do the same way. However, we're gonna just increase concurrency, just like a reactive programming, and also uh, like a less memory, like less resources, just like a uh, reactive programming. That's the idea and the goal of a project loom is to make it happen. So let's a little bit uh, uh, narrow down how loom is uh, working for that and how to make that happen. So there are a, a few like a different term in the project loom. For example, 
carry a thread and like just like a worker or like some event loop. So it's a really like a thread pole. You can just understand that. And then now we have some shared pole, like a database connection pole. You can create a connection pole. Whenever you ask like a data transaction, you're going to share the connection pole. You can use that. You can return that resources. So similar concept, not exactly the same thing though. So carrier, uh, carrier thread is some kind of connection pole, like a, some thread pole. And then we're going to create a, like a fork join uh, mechanism. You're going to have uh, some new request. We're going to create fork and join a new actually virtual thread here. And then we keep creating virtual thread. And then there are some executor, just like a reactive programming model. And the executor literally run allocated your uh, application on virtual thread, like a dispatch it. And then if you got some IO operation, even you're running your application running on virtual thread, you're going to stop it and then resume just like that. So just like uh, I'm going to, you're going to hit the IO operation. I'm going to just uh, take it off from thread pole, which is a carrier thread. And then you want, w w once you are done your IO operation stuff, okay, I'm going to take that back, put it back in your thread pole. That's pretty simple. That's really bookkeeping uh, do that. But again, you can also create a multiple carrier thread. It's a automatically a project to manage this kind of scoping and uh, scheduling and managing your resources. So, but how do you like uh, manage the multiple carrier thread, like a pole, when you just keep running multiple Microsoft application running on JVM so there are very interesting um, feature in a mechanism in a project room is the fork join based on works delete. So project room is a room keep ma monitoring the the carrier threads and then oh the first carrier thread is pretty much busy because you already dispatch a lot of virtual thread even if some of the virtual thread is a stop it it's a, you're gonna say it a part on part is that really the term in the in the interface in the implementation in the underneath. However, so it looks like a pretty busy. And then another carrier thread is a pretty, uh, like a resource is available at a time. Okay, I'm gonna just uh, steal that continuation from existing a uh, former carrier thread and then put into another uh, thread. It's just based on fork that thread continuation and then join the other carrier thread. It's a pretty much a simple, and then you don't need to actually develop a standpoint. You don't need to worry about this kind of whole mechanism. The project will automatically take care of that for developer. And then whenever I talk about this kind of concept and then a little bit technical standpoint, a lot of people are asking me, hey, Dan, so after I heard your presentation, I feel like uh, Project Loom pretty much a similar concept with the reactive programming. So can I say is the like a 95% similar? Yeah, yes or no? Because it's a pretty much the same, but in underneath implementation is totally different. But just conceptually, in the left hand side, in a carrier thread, it's uh, all about virtual thread uh, mapped to your request. And the executor and the bookkeeping is uh, one of the key pillar and the component. Uh, manage your virtual thread, like scheduling, scoping, and uh, checking, and monitoring the states, and things like that. Reactive programming model, you have a, like a, courier th a carrier thread uh, responsibly uh, is done by event loop. And then every request, you're going to have uh, own executor and the bookkeeping uh, mechanism to continuation, store data, and then, then back to the uh, restore very similar. However, the implementation stuff, executor is literally uh, some of the interface in the Java interface. So in a Loom project, it actually implement that executor. Uh, Quarkus actually uh, implement executor uh, with that, with that like a, uh, the vertex, uh, vertex, uh, yeah, vertex event loop. Uh, what is that called? I just remember, I don't remember that exactly. Oh yeah, so the executor actually implement by the fork join thread or uh, a fork join pool class or a thread pool executor. So one of the classes actually implement inside the project room. 
to implement executive interface in a project room side. However, the uh, event loop is, a, for example, Quarkus side. The Quarkus implement executive interface based on uh, Vertex event loop executor because of Quarkus was born reactive programming engine, which is a Vertex and Netty. So this is a, a similar concept uh, have in the uh, event-driven programming and also uh, reactive programming and versus project loom. So this is a little bit more detail around the how to suspending the virtual thread in project room. Just like uh, there are some park and unpark uh, concept. So it literally park means that we're gonna store your stack and the register unpark means when we need to restart and resume our running, stopping and suspending thread, like a, just like a callback lambda expression, just like I mentioned, this similar concept in the reactive problem model. And then when you ask call unpack, it's literally summit run, which you literally run your uh, application workload and the virtual thread. So uh, this is, uh, so you, we have like a multiple three virtual thread, the virtual thread one and two, three, and starting with the virtual thread two, it's gonna start a just using the shared carrier thread as a resources standpoint. And then when you uh, hit the ID, IO operation stop, you want to just support your virtual thread. And in the meantime, and then, okay, uh, we're going to allocate this resource in another virtual thread. And then this is literally uh, called the unpar, which means called the underneath the run method inside the project loop uh, classes. So it's a little bit uh, boring, too many uh, theory stuff. And then let me give you some uh, example here. It's a quick example. So this is a very simple example, uh, Quarkus. So Quarkus actually enable uh, uh, to integrate a project room like a, since almost a year ago in the Quarkus 2.10, something like that. It's a very uh, uh, experimental thing at a time. And then a couple of weeks ago, almost a month ago, we released Quarkus 3. And then we got a more, a more like a stable feature inside the Quarkus to enable the virtual thread stuff part of the project room. But still, there are a long way to improve and then give us a more fantastic feature. So embed the blocking in the Quarkus side, so here's a to-do classes. It's just like an entity class in your database, like a Java beans. It's literally connect to like, a, for example, PostSQL database and then grab all data from the uh, database using uh, Quarkus, Hibernate, ORM, and a Panache extension, which allows me uh, to use existing uh, fundamental operation. So I don't need to implement like a getter setter, also fundamental operation, for example, list all data, or delete data, and get data, or create data. So this is one of the benefit compared to Spring JPA. And then uh, it's pretty simple to be obvious. And then what about the reactive stuff, the right-hand side? As you can see, the return signature is different, like a uni. Like a Spring Boot use a WebRocks to reactive programming. You're gonna return uh, mod, the mono, it's a one event, or the streaming event is a flux. So Quarkus actually implement a mutiny based on small ride project and integration, uh, which allows Quarkus developer to use uni multi signature as a method return type. So uni really like a, a mono, like a, just a one event, and then multi is a really multi streams like a, like a flux in the Spring web flux stuff. And then you also need to really change your um, business logic to return all data. And then a virtual thread is a very interesting in Quarkus side. Only different thing is between virtual thread and that you are non-reactive programming in a Quarkus project, you just see only different, so one annotation, run on virtual thread. That annotation actually make your method as uh, running on virtual thread, like a blocking stuff, not reactive way. So underneath, how Quarkus actually detect and recognize this is a reactive programming, this is a non-reactive programming, this is a uh, virtual thread application. You know, this is a secret source here. 
So two different way Quarkus actually uh, recognize. One is the return time, like a method signature. So if you return like a string correction array without multi and uni, so Quarkus just expect, oh, this is a non-reactive application. And then, or uh, you can return uni and multi, oh, this is a reactive programming. You can also uh, configure obviously and explicitly with annotation. Like uh, even if you can return a string type, which is Quarkus expect, oh, this is a non-reactive programming. And then you can put in the like a non-broken annotation on, the, on top of the method. Oh, Quarkus actually prior, give some priority annotation. Okay, this is gonna be treated by non-reactive program because non-reactive program is non-broken IO based on event loop. So with the annotation or method signature, so two way you can actually combine two way or uh, choose one of, one of them uh, to make your Java method as a reactive or a non-reactive or even uh, virtual thread treatment as well. So when you use the reactive programming or the non-broken annotation on Quarkus side, you can have like a fixed number of event loop. For example, like I just said, like a, a couple of like a two one three, rather than like a exactly same number of your request. And then even if you're gonna block in or imperative application, you always a limited number of workers. So that's a big challenge for uh, high scalability and concurrency application with event-driven architecture. However, when you use the virtual thread, like a project room in the Parkers, you also have very dynamic number of virtual threads. Just imagine that, I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of people actually have some experience to use a virtual machine like a VMware or Red Hat virtualization and a lot of like a Hyper-V or Microsoft. So that concept, you have a limited physical server also known as a veil metal. And then you have a hypervisor technology which he create a virtual machine on top of the veil metal. And after that, you can set up your, uh, the capacity or resource capacity of your virtual machine, like a vCPU, like a four, and the v memory like a 62. However, it doesn't mean you're gonna always use a full vCPU or 62 v memory. It's, a, it's, a, it's a just a maximum stuff. You cannot use over that number. However, it doesn't mean you're gonna always use 100% realization. So that's why uh, the, you can create a um, number of virtual machine on bell metal way uh, bigger than your physical resources number. So that hypervisor actually manages that kind of thing. So virtual thread and then carrier thread is all about a uh, similar concept uh, compared to like a virtual machine and hypervisor and bell metal. Also, the, when you have uh, some chance to take a look at the project room, and then they say virtual thread is a lightweight thread, also fibers. So, you know, dynamic number of a virtual thread is a more efficient and the cheaper, and then for one uh, request with some career thread. So let me go to uh, a demo, and then here is my uh, GitHub repository, Daniel030, and the Quarkus Studio app main. So you can visit my uh, GitHub repository, uh, radio this talk, and you can just clone it, and then just running on your machine, you literally the same result. Alrighty, so this project actually uh, multiple projects, three projects, hopefully everybody see that. Okay, let me try to one more bigger. So three projects. So one project is based on non-reactive uh, to-do, and then the other one's a project room. Here's a baseline, project room actually uh, still uh, preview feature on JDK. It's only available open JDK 19 and later version. So today I'm gonna using JDK 20. Uh, it will be like a stable feature once JDK 11 release, gonna be like a, uh, like a this fall, like a September or October timeframe. But for that, it's a still preview feature. And this is a project room, this is a reactive stuff. Let me try to go to a uh, little bit, take a look at the project thing. So, so all project actually using race to one, here, uh, three, one, two, final. And default Java version is 17. 
And then, so here's a uh, three module. So when you go to first module, it's a first project. And then you're gonna have a same, like a Hibernate ORM. And we're gonna use it the post SQL. And then uh, you're gonna, you, we're gonna use a Hibernate ORM Panos. It's like a SQL mapper and it gives some uh, active record pattern. I don't want to develop any kind of DB transaction uh, fundamental operation. And also I'm gonna use uh, like a JSON to re uh, return the JSON format file. So here's my application. Uh, I'm gonna show you real quick. So to do is just like an entity class. As you can see, I'm gonna just implement a public like a like a database field name like a title. Comfort is a blue, balloon point, and then boolean, and then here is some of the list. I don't have any uh, getter setter, and then I don't have any like a persistent some of stuff. Because when I go in uh, a Panas entity, it actually uh, gives some more. Detail. When I go to Panas Entity, here's a Panas Entity base. This is all already implement all kind of data uh, database operational stuff here. How to uh, persist my data, how to delete my data, and then uh, how to uh, retrieve my data, uh, just all data or some find by specific particular ID. So this is one of the great things. You can also uh, very traditional uh, repository pattern when you develop the data transaction, like a cross transaction, just like a Spring Boot JPA as well. Alrighty, and then that's enough. And then here's a RESTful API resource, like a Spring Boot controller. And then here's a RESTful API, and then uh, here is the uh, get method, and then uh, some particular ID. And then one uh, annotation transactional, which allows me save the data or update the data, like a uh, DML stuff in a SQL perspective. I'm gonna print out the thread, what is the current thread? So let me try to terminal, and then I'm gonna try to run Quarkus project. And then one interesting is, so Quarkus actually provides the dev services, and then which he based on test containers. But test container, in order to use a test container, you know, you wanna set up test container, your uh, Java project, like a Maven Gradle, and also specify configuration and which container image I need to pull down my local system. And what kind of literally configuration, for example, PostSQL database, what is the JDBC URL and a username, password, and things like that. So Quarkus actually get rid of the fundamental responsibility from application side and the developer. Just use that, Quarkus automatically stand up relevant container image as long as you already run container runtime, which is Docker, PubMed. And then uh, set a default configuration, uh, which is a mandatory, like a username, password, or token, things like that. So I don't have any running process right now. And then I'm gonna run Quarkus uh, demo, or uh, you can use a Maven Gradle, things like that. So when I run, you can see that automatically uh, post code database is automatically stand up. So now I have a post SQL here, which is automatically stand up. When I just stop it, my uh, Quarkus demo, it automatically terminated my container runtime, like a container uh, process, which is really convenient for me. I don't need to use a Docker CLI or Podman CLI and a, like a pull container and run container. I don't need to uh, stop it or Docker kill, Podman kill, pretty much easier. Okay, and then when you when you press it uh, like a here, and then I can see that my dev service configuration is automatically yeah I'm gonna just run this from Docker Hub, PostSQL 14, and then here's my old database like some uh, key and value. So when I, for example I don't want to use database password like Quarkus. In that case you're gonna go to resource and application property. As you can see, it's empty. I don't need to add any kind of configuration, but I already set up database, which is really awesome. If you change that, just override, like a, like a password, like a Daniel. You can change that. You don't need to even remember all key and value. You don't need to go to like a, some stupid documentation. It's a pretty convenient, isn't it? And then I'm gonna go to uh, the web UI, and then here is, okay, uh, pretty good. So I just introduced Quarkus in parallel application. I just a little bit talk about Hibernate Panache, and then I'm gonna just showcase the visit Quarkus on website. 
uh, which is uh, everybody knows at quarks.io. And then you can see that we actually launched Quark 3 a uh, month ago. It literally, uh, we support like a Jakar EE10. You cannot find the Java X package namespace anymore. And then we support Hyperday ORM S62, which is way different and way uh, high performance than uh, Hibernate 5. And we also spend a lot of time uh, like a developer experience uh, and uh, productivity in the Kubernetes integration and also MicroProfile 6 in uh, Java 17, things like that. Okay, so when I go back to my terminal, now I can see that my thread is just executor thread, which is just a worker. And then when I, like, a, like a, let's try to, hey, uh, Box days. And then I just create a new one, and now you can see the new one. And then I just create a new one here also. Thread is a worker thread. If I the reload and then restore all data again, and I got a new, it's just a worker thread. So this is literally uh, when you just develop non reactive application on the Quarkus, Quarkus automatically detects, oh, this is a non reactive. I'm going to just run your application as a worker, which means I'm going to uh, ask uh, and then uh, scheduling an operating system to create a new worker thread uh, as long as your local machine, for example, my local machine, Mac OS, and then ARM64 allows some, uh, allocated some resources. Okay, I'm going to stop it, and then I'm going to change it like a reactive programming. And then, first of all, I'm going to run, again, Quarkus demo. And back to the uh, project, and so let's go to reactive programming. And the reactive programming, it's a pretty much simple. One different thing is that our Palm XML, you can see that all reactive stuff. So this is a reactive, uh, uh, like a reactive, uh, reactive and reactive, uh, like a post-SQL client. We're gonna just react to all data transaction and things like that. And application, we're gonna slightly change it also. You can see that the uni, not just REST, and then we're gonna wrapping our uni, and then also they are just return type, things like that. So this is really Quarkus detect automatically, even if there is no number of okay, annotation, with the method signature and return type, Quarkus gonna just treat it, this application as the reactive programming. Now, just my Quarkus application run, I'm gonna go back to WebNUI, revisit and reload. And now we're gonna really change that here, Quarkus reactive application. And reactive power of Quarkus is a high concurrency and then uh, cheaper and then your cost. And then we also hibernate reactive with the Panache. So you don't need to worry about some like a uh, data transaction programming with the reactive program. And I also show my uh, Daniel TV, uh, I already uh, recorded some of the demo with that, like more than 200. So let me try to, hey, uh, it's a uh, Quarkus, reactive apps, and I just save a new one and back to the terminal. Now you can see that, so new terminal uh, is thread, is an event loop, just like I mentioned earlier. So previously, just executor is just a worker. And now Quarkus automatically detect, oh, this is a reactive method and application. So we're gonna, I'm gonna run this application as an event loop, virtual thread. So pretty much easier. It's a not a wholly changing your application. Now I'm gonna stop once again and then change one last directory, project loom, and I'm gonna run Quarkus Quarkus step again, and then go back to my project. And the last thing is, it's a very simple, like a just transact with your database, like a PostSQL, and then a bunch of the RESTful API. The web UI is really called the RESTful API to connect to your database. In the meantime, you're gonna keep doing the database transaction with a non-blocking way and the blocking way, and the, this is a blocking plus a virtual thread. So this application, and one interesting, when I go to Palm XML, this is a wonderful secret, how to enable this preview feature on the JDK uh, enable project node. When you go to Palm XML and then, here we go, uh, generate, is that my thing? Oh, it's a reactive stuff. It's a too big for me, I'm gonna close all and then open project room and then palm XML. 
here we go. Here is the uh, Maven plugin compiler. I'm gonna set my release, which is 20, because I'm using uh, Java 20 right now. And then I'm gonna enable a preview feature in the parameter. This uh, few compilation allowed me run my application code on top of the virtual thread. You can also make sure you're gonna install uh, JDK 19 or 20 or 21. And another interesting plugin in the short fire is uh, allows you to debug your application. Because of virtual thread, it's not super convenient to troubleshoot your application, not just like a heap dump stuff. So because sometimes, even if you're gonna do uh, uh, like a, so running on virtual thread, but sometimes it's uh, not gonna work. Like I just literally use uh, pin the thread. So that's why you can enable this feature. You can actually, which method classes actually uh, break the rule of the virtual thread and then you're gonna use a pin thread. I'm gonna talk a little bit about just a little bit later. Oh, we have a running on time. Okay, I'm gonna run here and then go back to revisit uh, when UI. Now I have the uh, compare impaired reactive stuff, and then I just talk about Project Noom and how to quirks integrate in Project Noom with some compilation. And then let me try to, uh, this is the last demo today. I just save a new uh, entity here, and then back to the terminal. Now you can see that the first thing is a virtual thread. But the, when I save it, it's a back to the worker thread. So when you go back to, so let me try it once again. So when I reload and then all retrieve all data, that is a still virtual thread. However, when I will create a new one and it actually go back to worker thread, what happened? When I go back to my application and then uh, go to my resources classes, I actually print all run on virtual thread. I didn't forgot it. And for example, here, list all data, I already put in the run on virtual thread. This is really running on virtual thread. And when I create the method, I put in the uh, run on virtual thread, but it doesn't work. The reason why is uh, it's not only Java framework. So even if I say the virtual thread enablement, however, the ecosystem, for example, PostSQL driver is not 100% ready to run that kind of mechanism on the virtual thread. As long as I'm gonna use a transaction annotation, which is like a Java synchronize or notify or persistent, something like that. So I can easily fix that problem very manually, very traditional way, uh, something like here. I just took it off the, the transaction annotation. Instead, I put in the all this kind of uh, panache transaction measure. I actually manually implement all kinds of stuff. This is uh, not Simple, save a file. The one of the beauty of the Quarkus is a live coding capability. Let me try go back to WebUI and reload again. And it's still, and then still virtual thread is working. When I reload again, it's still virtual thread. I'm gonna create a new one. And now you can see that the new thread is also virtual thread. So that's literally how to uh, fix the pin the project. But some problem is can be fixed on my application side, but some problem can be fixed by your application side. It's literally your ecosystem should be fixed the problem. So let me go back to slide, and then I'm gonna read me fast. So that's really one annotation is not enough because some of the uh, like an ecosystem mechanism or algorithm, it's literally only use the, the pin uh, carrier thread mechanism and program model, which is even if we set it up, I'm gonna run this application as a virtual thread on the run on virtual thread annotation, but the underneath ecosystem, oh, I don't care. I just use a pinned carrier, th carrier thread. I don't want you to listen to your voice. That's really happened. So that, that's literally like a, you, if you have a native comparison, like a, like a Spring native and a Quarks native, so native is, is a really the block uh, carrier thread, not gonna run in a virtual th thread at this moment. And you're gonna use like a synchronize or Nettiata, like a transaction manager or a uh, Jakar EE or a Java EE, the uh, transaction manager. It's all about just keep using and carry, pin the carrier thread, which is AKA worker thread, rather than um, 
virtual thread. So the point is many Java ecosystems still need to rewrite to use a virtual thread and run your application. So like I mentioned earlier, so we're gonna still work around just in some of the case, but not all the case. So, but some people ask me, is this still worth using a virtual thread even if pre preview, even if it's a release like a Java 21? Yeah, yes or no? And then I, I would say yes, because I got some here at the benchmark test here, same app, the same application, I'm gonna use that, but some of the uh, here, uh, some concept, like I'm gonna use in a small container, like a half of VCPU and a 512 megabyte in memory stuff, using the same example, and I showcase my demo. And then, so you're gonna, you're gonna, I'm gonna use the, like a blocking and a virtual thread and just non-block application, reactive application, and then uh, imperative application, and also using database here. And so here's the interesting number, maybe you might interesting, because you're, you still curious about the virtual set is really good. So as you can see, the, here's the response time. So first, like a very beginning concurrency level, virtual thread and reactive program really good response time, it's fast response time, and then good high throughput. However, so once uh, the concurrency level exceeds, uh, for example, like a uh, 3700 level, and then Virtual thread uh, response time pretty slow, even if it's slow than uh, just a worker, like a blocking application. And then throughput also, like a 3700 concurrency level, it's a way uh, less than w even worker. So, so in, in just case, some of the case in the concurrency level, so we have only concurrency level less than 2000. Okay, virtual threads are pretty much better than faster and cheaper than your like a traditional imperative application. However, reactive application all the time super better than react, uh, virtual thread application as well as uh, blocking application. So what about the resources and the CPU and then uh, RSS memory, like heap memory plus and non heap as well? It's also same concept. Until some of the concurrency level, virtual threads are way better than uh, Broker blocking application, but reactive application all the time is a less memory and then less CPU. But in after some of the concurrency level, virtual thread is the application on the virtual thread is more less, uh, more uh, consume memory and CPU realization rather than uh, blocking application. Even if it's uh, happening similar in container environment like a Kubernetes. Because Kubernetes, you expect that there are many concurrency and uh, high scalability, just like a, a, like a 10,000 like scale out based on event-driven application. So this is a, once again redefined. So we combine as a goal of a project room, okay, it's simple development model, and then resource efficient and how high concurrency. I'm gonna ask once again, so, so simple development model, yeah, yes or no, it's a little bit okay because the I can really easy with the Quarkus integration just to print the one annotation. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, depends on the which Java ecosystem you're gonna use. So that's why I wanna say, okay, not thumbs up. So high concurrency, yeah, still good. But the resource efficient, yeah, finger crossed. Because uh, when you reach out and uh, exceed some of the level of concurrency, it's a way less than even blocking model. So it's now all the all the way, not thumb job. It's sometimes thumb do, like some like okay worth of finger crossed. There. So key takeaway is so Quarkus keep having effort and give some effort to integrate um, like a all reactive API like a database and network client and then like a Quarkus QE like a Quarkus Qt a template engine. So we're gonna uh, more uh, integrate feature uh, as friendly as uh, virtual thread. But however, we still have some issue to integrate ecosystem. It's not from a uh, problem from like a Quarkus. For example, the Helodon Oracle, they also use uh, PostSQL client based on Netty. They had the same issue, just like a Quarkus, like a, a data transaction. Back to the worker, not keep doing virtual thread. And then we're gonna some roadmap to integrate uh, like a Kafka messaging and WebSocket, and we're gonna keep doing tuning stuff. So you're gonna, how do you start Loom on your Quarkus project? Simple, two things. You're gonna start JDK 9, 19 or a later version, and you just use 
add the one annotation and then make sure uh, enable preview like a pin thread which you're gonna uh, notify which thread, which method actually break the rule, like a virtual thread stuff. So my session title, Quarkus 3, the road to room for cheaper, faster, easier, concurrent application. I'm gonna just ask uh, like a question mark because the with the carrier thread pinning, it's not always uh, efficient. So maybe concurrent is still good and a little bit simple. Sometimes uh, you are netty and then relevant uh, carrier thread uh, could be compromised. And so again, I could just uh, put in the old kind of demo stuff, my YouTube channel, yeah, feel free to scan in and then subscribe, and then ask me, hey, Dan, I need to run something new around uh, Quarkus or Spring Boot or comparison or Kubernetes scalability, and then I'm more than happy to uh, uh, address your technical question and then creating new uh, tutorial content as well. That's it. Yeah, uh, sorry for the running all the time, and uh, thanks for coming, and hopefully enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.